last month when we were driving back from Pennsylvania, we had a beautiful day as we were driving back. We were down there because uh, we were celebrating Patty's birthday, and that was the reason why we were down to visit our son Scott and his wife and our daughter, granddaughter Catherine. And it was a beautiful sunny day. We'd had good time with them there. And as we were driving back to New York State, the forecast was that we were supposed to have rain and sleet here in New York. You know, and here we had snow this morning on Easter. Uh, so it shouldn't surprise us, I suppose, if we're coming back to New York, and that's the forecast. But it's beautiful sunny weather all the way through New Jersey, all the way through Pennsylvania as we're coming up. We cross over in the New York State at the line, and all of a sudden it starts raining. And so it's raining and off and on with the sun coming out as we're driving through Binghamton. And as we're coming through Binghamton, there is a beautiful rainbow that was off on the, the right side of the car. And it was one of those rainbows like you see pictures of where it's the full thing, the whole rainbow. You can see both ends of it, just the whole thing and nothing's missing, it's all out there. And the sun was coming out, it was raining at the same time and it was a, a beautiful rainbow. The, the rainbow forms an arc of course, in the sky when you see that. And there's, it's, you always, at least I don't know about you, but you always try to find and see if you can see the, each end of a rainbow when it shows up there. You know, even if you just see a little bit, you kind of look the other direction, see if you can see the rest of it. We want to see the beginning, we want to see the end of this arc. And this arc that we can see in a rainbow uh, is a, a shape that we also can see in stories, where in stories you can have an arc from the beginning of the story all the way through to the end of the story. That's called the story arc or the narrative arc that shows that whole unit of literature, whatever it might happen to be. Our text that we're looking at this morning is found in Matthew chapter 27 and Matthew chapter 28. And there is very definitely a story arc or narrative in this passage that we're looking at today. It is, of course, the resurrection. That's what we're going to be looking at this morning on Easter Resurrection Sunday. But this narrative arc begins, I believe, at chapter 27, verse 62, and it continues to the end of the book, chapter 28, the last verses, uh, verse 20. And this arc, if you can imagine this arc, it starts off, and like a rainbow in the sky, it's over the whole passage to the very end. Now, if you have a story, a narrative, or an arc, or a unit like that, it's very natural to see that whole unit together. And it's appropriate as you're reading your Bibles, when you read a narrative passage, whether it's the Old Testament or the New Testament, to consider why did God put this here, this story, this narrative here in the way that he did. And when we look at this passage, there are a lot of, you can, you, you all know the resurrection story. You've read these verses hundreds of times. You're familiar with them. If I start to quote one of the verses, you'll probably be able to finish it for me because you've read them and heard them so many times. But we have to consider why did God lead Matthew to give this unit, this description as he did in this particular gospel account. You know each of the gospel accounts gives a different perspective of Jesus Christ's life. Each of the gospel writers has a different purpose. But why did God put this unit together in this particular way, leading Matthew by his Holy Spirit to give us this account? And that's what I want us to look at this morning, this account from after the ark starts, right after Christ was crucified. And he was there in the grave. He was buried. And that's where it starts off in chapter 27, verse 62. I'm going to read the last few verses of chapter 27 just to get us started in looking at our text today. Chapter 27, verse 62. Now on the next day, the day after the preparation, the chief priests and the Pharisees gathered together with Pilate and said, Sir, we remember that when he was still alive, that deceiver said, After three days, I am going to rise again. Therefore, give orders for the grave to be made secure until the third day. Otherwise, his disciples may come and steal him away and say to the people, He has risen from the dead, and the last deception will be worse than the first. Pilate said to them, You have a guard. Go and make it as secure as you know how. And they went and made the grave secure, and along with the guard, they set a seal on the stone. Now we read that paragraph there, which sets the, which sets the scene of what's taking place. If you didn't have that, you wouldn't know the background to why the women, when they went to the grave, didn't know who was going to roll the stone back for them. Why there was the, 
the whole situation as it unfolds for the resurrection. But as we look at the passage today, I would suggest to you that there are at least two different groups of people that are described in what we're looking at. On the one hand, you have the group of people that consists of Pilate and the chief priests and the Pharisees. You can see them all as very definitely one group. On the other hand, you can see the group of the disciples and the women and Jesus, and that's a different group. And Matthew treats them as two different groups. Here we find in these first, the first paragraph a description of Pilate and the Pharisees, and the soldiers are going to be uh, given responsibility for watching over things. And all the discussion in this paragraph is all about that first group, Pilate, the Pharisees, and the religious authorities. And then once we get to verse chapter 28, a little bit later it's going to shift. All of a sudden, then we're talking about the women and about the women going to the tomb and what they find there. Then it's going to shift back to the first group again. It's going to talk about the guards and when they go back and they report to the priests. And there's a whole paragraph there. And if you look at it, Matthew includes a very full ex explanation of what takes place in these two different groups of people. And what I would like to suggest to you as we look at it today is that this whole story arc is full of contrasts, contrasts all over the place. This morning I'm going to be calling attention to three principal contrasts that we can see in this whole narrative story. Contrasts, and you'll see them as we develop those. As a, the first I would like to call your attention to of these three contrasts is that the unfolding narrative shows a contrast of ability. Now this to me is almost the humorous part of it all. And I, I hope you'll catch a little bit of the humor as we look at this as well. In the verses I just read, verse 65, Pilate said, you have a guard, go and make it as secure as you know how. Now just think with me for that minute. Here we have the highest religious authorities going to the governor of the land who has responsibility representing Rome. He has all of that authority. And he says to the Pharisees, make it as secure, get that phrase, as you know how. Have you ever noticed that before in this passage? They literally had to, they did everything they could to try to make that stone and make that grave secure. I mean, they had guards, whether they used chains or ropes, depending on what movie you've watched, it could be one or the other, but they used whatever they could to secure it. They set a seal on it, which meant that with the authority of Rome, nobody was to break or to touch that seal. No one was supposed to do that. No one had a response, had, should be able to do that. So you have a uh, armed guard, you have ropes or chains, and you have the seal of, the, of Rome on that particular thing. They have made it as secure as they know how. But here's where the humor comes, their ability. It wasn't a problem for God, and it certainly wasn't a problem for this angel that showed up. Because when you switch over to the next verses, all of a sudden it's humorous what has happened to the armed guard the chains, and the Roman seal. It didn't have any ability to stop the resurrection of the Son of God. And the contrast here between the humans and God is astounding when you look at the end of chapter 27 and the opening verses of chapter 28. Chapter 27 closed with the governor saying, you make it as secure as you know how. Verse 1 of 28 says, now the Sabbath... As it began to dawn upon the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary came to look at the grave. And behold, a severe earthquake had occurred, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled away the stone and sat upon it. Now, stone wasn't a problem for the angel being in the way. He's just using it as a chair. I mean, <laughs> the angel is sitting on this stone. That they, The women were concerned who was going to roll the stone back, and the angel is sitting on it and says, don't be afraid. The humor between the end of 27 and the beginning of 28 is amazing. When you look at the ability, there should be a striking impression that this should make on you on the contrast between the ability of man to limit the power of God. It is amazing when you look at the contrast of ability between these two. Now, the next contrast that I'd like to call to your attention is going further than that, and that is a contrast of truth. I think you could probably, as soon as I say it, recognize that. What was the concern 
that the Pharisees and the religious leaders had when they went to Pilate back in chapter 27, verse um, 63. They said, Sir, we remember while he was still alive, that deceiver said. They're calling Jesus Christ the deceiver. And they're saying what's going to happen is that if we don't do something about this, his disciples are going to steal him away, and then they're going to lie and say that he rose from the dead. But the contrast to truth is that they were the ones concerned about the deception. But jump down to verse 11 of chapter 28. So while they were on their way, some of the guard came to the city and reported the chief priests all that happened. And when they assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers. And they said, you were to say, his disciples came by night and stole him away while we were asleep. And if this should come to the governor's ears, we will win him over for you and keep you out of trouble. And they took the money and did as they were instructed. And the story was widely reported, uh, widely spread among the Jews as it is to this day. Now, who was concerned about there being a deceiver and a lie? Back in chapter 27, it was the religious leaders who went to Pilate. But the contrast is one of truth. Because they who were the ones that said, we stand and represent the truth, and we don't want the deceiver to get away, and his disciples to misrepresent things, they themselves don't have a grasp for the truth at all. I'd like to point a second point out. The first point is man's ability against God's. Man can't do a thing compared to God's ability. But when it comes to truth that men present, it's, it pales in comparison to the truth that comes from God. We have the narrative and the storyline of what's explained here. They said he was a deceiver, and then they next say, chapter 28, verse 11, go lie. And well, here's some money to help encourage you. And if anything comes to the governor, lest your lives be in jeopardy, because Roman soldiers aren't supposed to sleep on the job when they're guarding, um, we will pay off the governor too. In other words, we have the resources and the truth is what we want to make it to be. Does that sound anything like you might hear the world saying today? The truth is, the, is contrasted here. They were concerned about Jesus and his disciples. However, they were the ones that were very much lacking the truth. So the second contrast that we would look at here is a matter of truth. There's a huge contrast in truth. Now, remember, Matthew does not teach like the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul were writing this. The Apostle Paul might say, now the first thing for you to exhort the brethren is such and so and such and so, and in one of his epistles. Matthew gives the narrative, the description. But the point that we mustn't miss is the point that Matthew is making as he gives us this story arc, the narrative, the story. Matthew is making a point here by telling you what happened with the people. And there's a contrast between the ability of the leaders and the truth of the leaders compared to what's taking place. The third contrast that I want to call to your attention, though, is that the narrative shows, the unfolding narrative shows a contrast of authority. And this, I believe, is the most striking and the most significant of all. Back in chapter 27, the religious leaders are the ones that have the authority, the jurisdiction over the temple, the temple precincts, all of the religious leadership for the children of Israel. There's their leadership and authority. But you know, it doesn't do anything compared to God. Because how does our passage end? It ends with Matthew 28, with what we know of as the Great Commission, where Jesus speaks to his disciples in verse 18. Chapter 28, verse 18, Jesus says, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. And he goes on, he gives us commission. But what's amazing is to look at the contrast between chapter 27, the religious leaders, and Pilate. They had authority. Yeah, right. Not really. They couldn't, they couldn't stop the, the, the stone from being rolled back. They couldn't stop Jesus from rising from the dead. They who thought that they were the ones that are after truth are the ones that are the liars and deception and paying, off, paying people off along the way to try to present a lie and they have no authority whatsoever compared to what Jesus now says at the end, all authority is mine. There's a huge, huge contrast, and this last one I believe is the most significant. There are other contrasts you can find as well. But what you have to consider when you have a narrative passage like this is that there's a building, 
And up until we get to when Jesus appears to his disciples in verse 16, these have been story of events. This has happened. The religious leaders um, and the guards, they did this, and such and so happened. And this happened over here, and they did this. And this happened over here, and, and, the, and, and the ladies went and told the disciples, and all that. What's very interesting is the whole thing of the supernatural. See, there's one other character that we didn't talk about yet, and that is the angel. When you look back in chapter 28, it says that there was an angel of the Lord, verse 2, an earthquake, an angel descended from heaven and came away, or rolled away the stone and sat upon it and describes his appearance. His appearance was like lightning and his clothing was as white as snow. Now, if we look at society today, we find that there are a lot of people that deny the supernatural at all. They would have a trouble with this story. They, would probably, they could possibly deny the resurrection at all. But they deny the supernatural and they question whether or not there is a God. The same people today, many of them, have no trouble believing science fiction. In science fiction, you can have all sorts of beings from other planets that have all amazing abilities and things that they can do. You pick your science fiction story of your choice and whether or not they can see through, walk through, talk through, transport themselves to other dimensions, or any of that science fiction stuff, they have no trouble imagining in their brain that that could be possible. They certainly recognize it as science fiction, but they can imagine it's possible. Or take another example. The same ones that can deny the truth of Christ have no trouble imagining a fantasy world, a fantasy world where you could have wizards and magic and potions and all sorts of things that can be done that can transform and change and give you miraculous power and ability. And in their minds, they can imagine all of that. As though, not that it's real, they wouldn't, I don't think most of them would say it's real, but they can imagine it's possible to think of it that way. So you have the science fiction can be imagined, and the fantasy world can be imagined. And the same people would deny that there could be a God who is sovereign and over all. Folks, they have set an arbitrary limit that they choose not to go beyond. It is their choice not to believe the possibility that there could be a God who is sovereign and is over all. They have arbitrarily said, we are not going to go any higher than this. You Christians, you will, you will be crazy folks. You want to believe in God if you want. But we are smart and we know there can't be anything above as high as our arms can reach. We have no trouble imagining a science fiction world. We have no trouble imagining a fantasy world. But you Christians are the nuts because we know everything and nothing can go beyond what we can personally comprehend or grasp. So that's why I'm calling attention to the angel. Because when the angel appears, it says that the guards' response, they shook for fear and became like dead men. I suspect when they got up that morning, they weren't expecting the day to go the way it did. I suspect that it was a huge surprise. But it's all a matter of God who is over all. Jesus Christ rose by the power of God. Jesus Christ was God. The stone wasn't rolled back so that Jesus could get out. He had already risen. The stone was rolled back so the ladies could see in, and Peter, when he got there, could walk in and see he is not here, and there are the grave clothes left behind. Jesus, who went right through the grave clothes, went right through whatever the roof of the tomb happened to have been. And the stone was only rolled back so that people could see in and that it was empty. God performed the resurrection of his son. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. The supernatural can be seen right here, and people that choose to disbelieve it have set an arbitrary limit saying, we are choosing to lock ourselves in this room because we know there can't be anything outside of this room. And I hope that hits you when you realize they have no trouble imagining a fantasy world or a science fiction world. But they choose to say it's impossible. It's not even possible that there could be anything beyond what we can perceive and sense and measure scientifically or by means of human reason. So there's a lot of things happening here that Matthew has included 
in the narrative that what they present show a huge bunch of contrasts. This last contrast that I'm giving is one of authority. On the one hand, we found in the beginning the authority of the religious leaders and Pilate. Contrast that to how it ends and Jesus' first words. He says, all authority is given to me. Now, I want us to talk about that. Just think about that for a little bit. From the gospel accounts, no matter which one you're reading, you'll read that Jesus had power, miraculous power to perform miracles supernaturally that testify by signs to the fact that he had power. He was the one that was chosen from God. And the Gospel of John, as we're going through now, we can see from the marriage of Cana, a Galilee where he turned the water into wine. Jesus had power over the natural world. He could turn substance from water to wine. We also could see that Jesus had power to create food to feed 5,000. He had power over the material world. We could see that when he was with the disciples in the, on the boat of the Sea of Galilee and a storm rose up, that he could speak to the waves and say, be still. He had power over the whole natural world that was under his control already before he was crucified. So here's something I'm going to throw out to you. Why did Jesus say this? Don't answer out loud. But why did Jesus say, all authority is given to me in heaven and on earth? I'm going to answer my own question in two parts. The first part is to give assurance to his disciples that he had authority over everything as he was commissioning them to take the gospel to all places. Have you ever thought about if anything was new now at this particular point? Could a sovereign, all-powerful, this is when, for those of you that want to strain your brain, think about this. Could a sovereign, all-powerful Jesus Christ in the previous chapter have more power than he has on now than he had before? An answer out loud. If you're all-powerful, can you increase it to be a, a greater power? Think about that. What's changed? What's different between the earlier chapters in Matthew and when Jesus says, all power is given to me? I'd like to suggest, yes, uh, some of you are showing he rose from the dead. Here's what I would like to suggest as a possible answer. Look with me, if you will, please, to Romans chapter 8. In Romans chapter 8, we find the picture that is, that Paul presents as a hypothetical in terms of um, who can bring a charge against um, one of God's children. And Paul then goes on and describes Jesus Christ and the role that he has in all of this. Romans chapter 8. Here we go. Romans chapter 8, verse, uh, verse 31. Uh, no, what happened is that I, I can't find my underline in my notes. I can't read it quickly enough. Um, and so I can't see where, my, where I have I have in my notes here someplace. I just can't find where it is. Um, in Romans chapter 8, the, the picture that we find here is where Paul is calling the attention to who is going to bring any charge against us. Here it is in verse 31 and following. Paul writes, what shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? For who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died, yes, who rather was raised, who is at the right hand of God and who intercedes for us. I would suggest that verse 34 has an answer to the power and authority Jesus has after the resurrection. Because until Christ rose from the dead, until that point in history, 
Though Jesus Christ, being fully God, had all power and authority over all things. He had power over the natural world, power to raise the dead. He raised Lazarus and the widow's son. He did all that. What Jesus could not do before his crucifixion and resurrection was when a charge was brought against anyone. He could not yet say, my blood has paid the penalty. But Romans 8.34 says Christ can now say no one can bring a charge against you because I have paid the penalty and so when you go to Matthew 28 and see that Jesus says all authority is given to me he already had power over creation he had power over the natural world he already had all that but he now has power over the sentence of death for everyone that puts his trust in him this is additional power that Christ has on this side of the cross and on this side of the resurrection. Now if you look at the narrative text, Matthew has said, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened, this happened. And all of a sudden you get to the words of Jesus at the end of this, and for those that are familiar with literature, this is the denouement. This is the climax, this is the unfolding, this is where everything comes together in these last words. Matthew has been building up. This took place, this took place. There's not a lot here. This took place, this took place. Until Jesus speaks. And Matthew, like a crescendo, has started off and he's been building up till Jesus says with his first words, all authority has been given to me in heaven and in earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I've commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of this age. There is the denouement. There is the climax. There is the coming together. That's a French word that it's used to refer to when everything in a story comes together. You're reading a mystery. You have a whodunit. Who, who's the one? Was it the butler? Or was it Aunt Matilda? I mean, who was it that that hit him over the head with a candlestick. You know, you, you fi and then finally, there's that one chapter, usually near the end, where all of a sudden you figure out, no, it was never who you thought it was. It was always somebody else that you would never suspect. Well, that's where it all comes together in the story. And Matthew, in this narrative, is this happened, this happened, this happened, leading up to Jesus saying, all authority is given me. Now, this is your commission. This is what you are to do. And Matthew closes his gospel in this way, saying, okay, now it's passed over to you. Christ has died. Christ has been crucified. He's risen from the dead, and he passes the baton to his disciples. He passes the baton to you, saying, all authority is given to me. I've now paid the penalty for your sins by my death on the cross. All authority I had is evidence in the narratives of the whole gospel. And now I can say, I, can't, I won't condemn you. My blood paid the penalty for your sin. Now you go and you give this good news to everybody. Cro cover the whole world as they are sharing the gospel, bringing them to make a decision for me. They'll be baptized in my name. And then you teach them all things. And as you do this, I will be with you to the end of the earth. As we look at this narrative, I said it was like a rainbow arc. It has a beginning. It has an end. It climaxes here with Jesus' words at the end. And I would suggest that the text, as we look and as a whole, we have to see the whole flow of the narrative text for where Matthew put the emphasis, and he backloaded it. <laughs> it was at the end with what Jesus had to say and commissioning. As I would close today, I would suggest that there are two calls that we can draw from this. In Philippians chapter 2, the Apostle Paul said, Have the same mind that was in Christ Jesus who left heaven's glories and he was crucified on the cross. He gave his life. And Paul then says in Philippians 2, verses 10 and 11, for this reason he was raised, that every knee should bow and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. 
the first call as we consider Christ having given his life on the cross and rising from the grave is a call to name him Lord of your life. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, that's the starting point. Because as we see in gospel, verse after verse, Jesus came to save, but as Jesus came to save, it's only for those that put their belief and trust in him. And intellectual knowledge is not sufficient. We've looked at that in the Gospel of John. Jesus knew people, people believed and they saw the signs and miracles, but it wasn't saving them. The Pharisees even figured out that he had to have come from God, and they certainly weren't accepting his message. Jesus' message in John chapter 2 and 3 is that you have to believe. Nicodemus, you have to believe. As the Son of Man is lifted up, you have to believe. So you have to call upon him, believing in Christ for salvation. But the second call, with this I'll close, is that as Jesus called his disciples and said, all authority is given to me, that he also was saying to his disciples, now, here's the baton, it's in your hand. I have all authority over heaven and earth, and I will plead your cause before anyone that charges you. By the way, think about this in terms of Satan, as he accuses you in your conscience and your heart because of your past sins that you've committed to him, as if you trusted Christ as your savior. And Satan is accusing and you feel it and you know that he's accusing you. Romans 8, Jesus Christ can say, I paid for that sin. It was covered by my blood on the cross. All authority, all authority is given to me and I have the authority or over even those accusations against your sin. The second is your conscience and heart can attack you with grief and guilt over past sins. And the past sins and the past guilt can be charging you and saying, you blew it, you blew it, you blew it, you blew it, you blew it so many times. Jesus Christ rose from the dead having paid for all the times you blew it and the time you're going to do it tomorrow. <laughs> he already paid for those. And so when he says all authority and no one can bring any charge, no one can bring a charge against you because what Christ has done. As you've trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you've put your trust as you've put your trust in him. As you put your trust in him, his blood covers all your sin. And we have to remember what Christ has done. All authority is given me in heaven and on earth. So I close by saying there are a bunch of contrasts in this passage. A contrast in ability and the ability of man pales in contrast to the ability of God. And it was clearly demonstrated at the tomb. They made it as secure, the pilot said, as they knew how. And it didn't matter how hard they tried. They couldn't stop the Son of Man from rising, and they couldn't stop the angelic messengers, the one angel that God sent. What if he sent a thousand? I mean, the one angel was enough. He was, those guards were no match for one angel that happened to come. They left as dead men. Imagine the supernatural power of God, the contrast and ability between the end of chapter 27 and the beginning of 28, the contrast of truth. Because people today will say, we have the truth, and you Christians are believing a lie. But guess what? The ones who are saying they have the truth do not, as we can see in this with the contrast of truth and where truth is found. And lastly, authority. There's presumed authority of those that are on earth. We are the ones that know. We're teaching you so you can be intelligent and know better through the media, through our schools, through our court systems, through our social media. We're telling you so you can be enlightened. But guess what? They don't know and they don't have the authority. The authority comes from God. Truth comes from God and we find it in his word that he's chosen to give us. So the challenge, those last two calls, call on Jesus Christ as your Lord and accept the commission that he's given to share the good news of the gospel with those before whom God gives you opportunity to talk. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we look at this closing narrative at the end of the Gospel of Matthew 
and we recognize its climax at the time that Christ spoke and gave his commissioning to his disciples. We rejoice that Christ rose from the dead this day. We rejoice in the fact that you has the, he has the power over death. But we re rejoice even further in the fact that Christ's resurrection, having borne our sins to Calvary, and our sins nailing him to the cross of wood, when he rose from the dead, it showed that we were all forgiven. And we praise and thank you that our sins are forgiven because of the blood of your son. And I pray for every one of your children, every one of us here today, that we would be faithful in sharing the good news with those that you give us opportunity to, to believe the truth in Jesus Christ. And Lord, I pray if there's anyone here that has never put his or her faith and trust in Christ as Lord, calling upon him for genuine salvation, trust and belief in him, Lord, I pray that you will draw that one to yourself, that he or she might pray the simple prayer of putting his or her trust in you and Christ's death on the cross to pay for his or her sin. Lord, we pray that your will might be done here in our lives going forward as we rejoice and praise you that Christ the Lord is risen from the dead. We pray in his name. Amen.